Because quite frankly, as your pastor, I have had my fill watching people get beat up by the devil. Tired of people, tired of people who focus on the attack but lose sight of God. And it's because the attack has been raging and we have failed to reason and fail to understand the reason for the attack. You are not under attack because you've missed God. You are under attack because you are smack dabble right in the middle of the perfect circumference of the will of God, and the devil can't take it. He's very upset with the momentum this house has. He's very upset with the traction we've gained. The very fact that your butt, excuse me, is in your seat is proof positive the devil's mad. But let me tell you something right here. He may form weapons against you, but no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And and if you don't believe anything else I've said so far, you better believe those first two words. You are about to get free indeed in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. We launch a three-week series today called Free Indeed because, quite frankly, I'm tired of the body of Christ living defeated lives. We are to live victorious lives. Matter of fact, this is not Survivor Fellowship Church. Are you with me? This is Victory Fellowship Church. And we are going to have victory in Jesus' name. Grab your Bible as I endeavor to launch out into this. For those of you that are accustomed to getting out by noon, uh, welcome. This must be your first service. Praise God. Welcome. Uh, my goal is not to get out of here at noon. My goal is is to not leave until Jesus is done. And so that's what we will endeavor today. So grab your Bible and go to the book of Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. I do apologize. I sent the uh, media folks verses 1 through 4. We're going to go through verse 8. Praise God. Amen. If you have it, say, I got it. If you're ready, say, I am. If you're not sure, clear your throat. Okay, okay, good. All right, let's look at what the word says. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and and it burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him from out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Verse 5. He said, do not approach here. Remove the sandals from off your feet, for the place which you are standing is holy ground, not because of the ground, but because of the fire of God. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry on account of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. Therefore, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the Fultonites. Free. Free. Indeed. Today is part one. If you're taking notes, my title today is Complete Freedom. I want you to listen to this statement very carefully. Freedom is never granted voluntarily by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. So we are here today to proclaim in this atmosphere, we are Free indeed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We have got to realize that the devil is not going to lighten up his hand off your life because he's feeling 
generous. It goes against the whole DNA of an oppressor to stop oppressing people. But rather, when the oppressed demand freedom, the oppressor backs up. And so we have not come in here to negotiate with Satan. We have come in here under the shadow of the Almighty in His secret place. And we are saying, if nobody else is free, I'm going to be free in Jesus' name. Are you with me? The first thing I want to tell you is that just because your enemy is near doesn't mean God won't flourish you. You shall flourish in the presence of your enemies. Somebody said, well, Pastor, I'd like to have some Bible on that. My pleasure. Psalm 23 and verse 5. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies. Some of you have been through a hard trial. And I'm here to tell you that God has already prepared the table. And guess what? The enemy is not sitting at your table. The enemy is watching you sit at a table. And the Bible says you'll feast in the presence of your enemy. Just because your enemy is near doesn't mean that you can't be blessed right in the middle of it. Because God said, I'll prepare a banquet for you and make the devil watch it. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Let him scheme. Let him plan. I'm going to sit with Jesus at the table in heavenly places, and I'm going to feast while he's scheming. Because guess what? God will cause me, just like Israel, to be blessed right next to my enemy. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to take you through a journey today. Is that all right? If you don't like scripture, you're going to hate this message. I only have 12 references. <laughs> Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, listen to this, says, Nevertheless, the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty. In the land of their enemy, not in Canaan, not in, not in Israel, they were not a nation yet. Not in Israel, but in the land of Egypt. In the inhabitants of the enemy's land, in the process, the Bible says that things were not well for Israel, but nevertheless, the Lord caused them to be fruitful and to increase abundantly and to multiply. See, it's very interesting. It's very interesting how the rules of multiplication. Let's talk math. One more week till school starts. Praise Jesus. Let's talk math because it's, it's, it's very interesting. The difference between addition and multiplication. Because addition does not say that you won't increase. But addition causes you to increase slowly. When the Bible says, I'll multiply you, that not only means that I'm increasing, but I'm increasing at a more rapid pace to the point the enemy can't keep up with my multiplication. And that is what the Bible says. They flourished in the land of Egypt. They were fruitful, they increased, and they were multiplied. Look at verse 9. Exodus 1 and verse 9. He said to his people, this is Pharaoh speaking now, Surely the people of the sons of Israel are more numerous and powerful than we are. I'm about to tell you something. And I'm trying to keep my cool, but I'm about to lose it. Because as Pharaoh had to declare that Israel had become more numerous and powerful than Egypt. So I'm telling you, the enemy that's been plaguing you is going to have to step back and make this declaration. Victory Fellowship Church is more numerous and more powerful than we are. That's what I'm here to tell you. That's what I'm here to tell you. To the spirit of addiction in Callaway County, those of Victory Fellowship Church are more numerous and more powerful than you are. That's what I want to declare to every demonic spirit coming against you. That because you are plugged in, 
you are not only increasing, but you are also multiplying in strength. Mm. More numerous, more powerful. The enemy doesn't attack because he's just mean. An enemy always attacks when he's threatened. I come from the state of Florida. And in Florida, we've got these wonderful animals, reptiles, called gators. And gators are interesting because if you don't go near their habitat, they leave you alone. And any time you read of an f- alligator attack in the state of Florida, it was usually because some hashtag Florida man <laughs> said to his buddy, watch this. <laughs> huh? I've met some Missouri folks that have something similar with Florida man. And it's usually when people don't stay where people are supposed to stay and they start invading a territory already inhabited that an alligator will strike and inflict damage on that person. So I have to tell you something. Because our church is kind of like the Florida man. We don't know enough to just stay in the territory of our building. We don't know enough not to get out there on the highways and the byways where the devil has had the territory. We don't know enough and we are saying to each other, watch this, and we are going and we are approaching enemy-held territory. And so we should not be surprised that when our church has had the most momentum we've had in three years, I would dare say much longer than that, that now the enemy attacks and we're shocked. The enemy has an alligator spirit. You stay away from his territory, he usually stays away from you. But the moment you put your foot in the pond, something begins to happen. Can I tell you something? 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 When we go to a neighborhood and got got burgers, dogs, and brats flowing and the gospel music playing and testimonies rolling and and things, evangelism happened, guess what? We're putting our foot in the pond. Can I tell you something? When you go to work and you're not just there to, to do your job, but you open your mouth and talk about Jesus, you're putting the foot in the pond. Can I tell you, when you talk to a neighbor who doesn't know anything about Jesus and you begin to open your mouth and share your testimony, you're putting your foot in the pond. And the alligator thinks he's coming to take you out, but he don't know we are not just a bunch of Jesus followers only, but we are those equipped and empowered with the strength of Jesus. Watch this. Watch this now. Watch. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Verse 11 and 12. Therefore, therefore, Egypt set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their labor. They built for Pharaoh's storage cities. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and they grew. Some of you are walking into church this morning and not with a praise of faith, but more with a complaint you call a prayer. And the complaint is, I don't know why. I'm being attacked. Sometimes you are attacked because God's trying to grow you. Well, if God loved me, he wouldn't allow the devil to attack me so much. You should open up a Bible and learn about the God you say you serve. Because he's always will. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Satan didn't even know who Job was. He was so protected until God opened his mouth and said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, there's no doubt that he trusts you. You've put such a hedge around his life. Nobody can get to him. So then God says it was God's idea. God said, go ahead. 
attack him. You can take everything but his life. The devil went forward and executed God's plan. What if I told you the very difficulty you're going through is not the devil's idea? What if I told you it was actually God's idea so that for one minute you could get your gaze off yourself and get your gaze back onto Jesus Christ? They took every, the devil took everything Job had. His children, his wife, his health, his finances, his land, everything he had. And in the midst of it all, Job praised the Lord. That's right. Oh, I got boils on my flesh? <laughs> Hallelujah. But now we are, we, are, we are in the kingdom now in comparison to Job, and we are a soft people. We don't even know what affliction is. We think being unfriended <laughs> is affliction. Tweeted about affliction huh that's not affliction let me tell you something if they unfriended you that's a blessing in disguise are you with me so we have to understand that sometimes sometimes the attack is not for the purpose of taking you out but just the opposite is for the purpose of your spiritual growth are you with me hmm afflictions increased but so did israel the enemy cannot stop us nope i'll tell you it can get hard we're going to get stronger it can become difficult we're going to grow and can i tell you something i remember i was told three years ago over three years ago i told a friend of mine i said i'm moving to missouri in the midst of covid to pastor a church we can't even open the building yet but we're going to do it anyway and he goes he said, you're insane. I said, I know, but what's your point? <laughs> he said, it's COVID. He said, now's not the time to take over a church. And I said, I didn't know there was a wrong time to take over a church. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, he, said, he, said, he said, this is ministry suicide. He said, he said your family's not going to be able to survive. You'll have no, no finances in the midst of COVID to do anything with. You're not, you're not going to be able to live in a house. You're not going to be able to afford groceries. This is, this is the wrong time. And I said, I said, well, I have one reason why I'm going to disagree with you. He said, what's that? I said, Holy Ghost told me to go. <laughs> and in the midst of COVID, I could start pointing to faces this morning where the ones... That showed up in the midst of COVID. You were with us during wide open. You were with us during shutdowns. And here we are. Here we are. And can I tell you, we've been nothing but financially strong for the three years that we've been here. I can tell you that for a fact. The enemy can't stop us. The enemy can't stop us. And I'm going to tell you something right now. It's not that we're never going to have an opposition, but I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. And everybody watching online wants you to hear what I'm saying. The enemy cannot stop Victory Fellowship Church. It's not happening. Not happening. The enemy can't stop Pivot. The enemy can't, can't stop Kids Corner. The enemy can't stop the nursery. The enemy can't stop expansion. The enemy can't stop the sanctuary. The enemy can't stop any of it because right in the midst of taskmasters, God will cause us to grow. Number two, my second point today is simply this. You have a target on your life. I want you to say that with me. I have a target on my life. The first, you've got the target on your life. You are targeted by God for favor. You're targeted by God for blessing. You're targeted by God for wonderful things. But can I tell you, you've got another target on your life. And just as you are targeted for favor by God, you are targeted for attacks by the devil that hates you. I'm going to say it again, and nobody's going to shout amen. Don't fake it till you make it, baby. You can be honest. But nobody gets excited when the preacher says, there's a target for attack on your life. Hallelujah, right? That's good news, isn't it? But the reality is, if you understand, God just said amen, so y'all should listen to what I'm saying. 
the reality is, listen to me very carefully, the reality is, if you understand the devil has targeted you for an attack, you then won't blame God when you're attacked. You'll understand where the attack is coming from. And why should you even wonder when God has blessed you so much in this house, why now you're going through a difficult time? There's a target on your back. But can I tell you, and I believe this with every fiber of my being, my target for favor is larger than my target for attack. My target for blessing is larger. He's saying amen more than you are. Huh? I'm going to show you scripturally. I'm going to show you scripturally. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 14. Let's look at this together. And they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and in brick and all the manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. That is being targeted for an attack. Look at Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. In the passing of the time, the king of Egypt died. And they thought, praise God. And the children of Israel sighed because of their bondage. And they cried out and their cry came up to God on account of the bondage. The Bible says their attack was so vicious so full of rigor, so hard for their lives that it made them cry. It made them sigh. I don't know if you know what that's like to have gone through so much hell in your life that what comes out of you is not joy. What comes out of you is frustration. That what comes out of you is not blessing. What comes out of you is <sighs> almost every wife in here knows when their husband is upset even when he's not saying a word. I'll sit in my chair and I'm, bless you, and I might go <sighs> and my wife will say, what's wrong? I was like, Nothing, I was just a deep breath, really, just a deep breath. But there have been times in my life when <sighs> meant a whole lot. I'm tired of this. I can't endure much more of this. You know what I found out? You know what I found out? This is going to help somebody. This, this is a revelation for somebody. I quit saying, God knows I can't take anymore. Because every time I've said those words, I was able to take a little bit more. But Israel was so burdened that the spirit of them went from trusting God to sighing. There was an oppression and a depression in their lives because of their taskmaster. Watch this now. God saw them. In the midst of it, he remembered, the Bible says, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God remembered his promise. And the reality is God was with Israel through the attacks. God was there when they were made to go and to do hard labor. God was with them when they were displaced. God was with them in the midst of it all. God was with them with the old king of Egypt. God was with them when the new Pharaoh rose to power. God was with them the whole time. And the reality is you can get under so much attack from your spiritual taskmaster that it will shift your gaze off of the fact God is with you and onto the fact that you've never suffered an attack like this. The problem is the attacks can develop, even for the believer, a victim mentality. I want to take it a step further. You can become attacked so much by the enemy 
that it will even create an attacked mentality. That even when something happens that is not an attack, you will define it as an attack because you stopped looking for blessing and you started to anticipate when the next attack is coming. It's a victim mentality. It's a victim mindset. God has not created you to be a victim. You're not a victim of your circumstances. You're not a victim of mean people. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. You see, see the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, I'm trying not to hurt people's feelings. But the problem is, um, the problem is, the problem is, the problem, oh, I'll just say to you, the problem is, you can become so offended that you begin to hear things that were never said. You can become such a victim that even when people look at you, you think they're accusing you. They could say eight good things about you and one critical thing about you and all you hear is, they hate me. That's not God's will. I'm about to set some people free this morning right here. Watch this. Everybody has an opinion. But much like their belly buttons, they should not let them show. <laughs> Tweet that if you want to. I don't care. It's the gospel truth. Well, I have a right to my opinion. You sure do. You have a human right to a lot of stuff. You don't have a kingdom right to it. Pastor, I don't have a kingdom right to my own opinion. No, because you're not the king of the kingdom. Our only right in the kingdom is to follow the king's orders. Whether we agree or disagree. If the king says it, we're all about it. Are you with me? And that's the problem. That's the problem. Is people, people redefine even what is said or done based on their mentality and not even based on the own situation right let's go a little further are you ready i know it's been hard so far we're going to turn around a minute just hold on all right i want you to write this down god hears god sees god responds in the midst of of their affliction, in the midst of their affliction, the Bible says, for God heard their cry and saw their affliction. You need to remember everything you go through, God sees it all. God hears every prayer. He's with you the whole step of the way. But watch this. But in the middle, in the middle of their affliction, Moses was born. God will always birth deliverance when the affliction is the hardest moses was born right in the middle of it god heard god saw and he did something about it he answered right in the middle of it moses was born in the middle of their oppression in the middle of their depression in the middle of their struggle in the middle of their sorrow pain and suffering god responded by giving birth to a deliverer now, isn't it interesting that if, if somebody said that to Israel, hey, good news, I know it stinks right now, but God just gave birth to your deliverance. All of Israel would have shouted and gotten excited. Huh? But Moses didn't show back up to deliver Israel for 80 years. Moses' life is broken down in three 40-year segments. For 40 years, he lived in Egypt. For 40 years. He thought he was the half-brother of Pharaoh for 40 years. And then after 40 years, Moses did something stupid, and Moses ran in fear, and he went and he hung out like the Beverly Hillbillies with Jethro. <laughs> and so he goes and he lives with his father-in-law, and he's out in the wilderness tending sheep, helping his father-in-law for another 40 years. 
And then when the man was 80 years old, God said, Moses, Moses, it's time to deliver my people. Some of y'all think God is through with you when you've already accomplished everything. Let me tell you something. If Moses didn't get started till he was 80, you got a little ways to go. Are you with me? Watch this now. Exodus 3, 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Look at verse 10. Come now, therefore, for I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God sent Moses back to the same place he ran away from. To approach not a man he saw as his enemy, but a man he loved. A man he grew up with. A man he played with. Jillian got a revelation this morning because she thinks the prince of Egypt is what happened. And she was like, Moses didn't look 80 when he went back. He looked like he was 35. But can I tell you something? An 80-year-old man walked back to speak to a man he loved. And he had a word from God to deliver to Pharaoh. Watch this. Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go. This is the demand for freedom. The demand of freedom. Moses stood in front of who he thought was his half-brother. And he stood before him with his brother at his side, and he says, I speak on behalf of all of Israel, on the God of Israel, let my people go. So I feel a Moses anointing on my life this morning. I'm tired. I'm tired of the devil trying to divide from within. I'm tired of the devil trying to weaken the foundation of the church from within. Because people feel attacked by every single thing that happens in their life. So I am declaring in the presence of God and the presence of all of you people, it is time for the devil to let my people go. I'm here to declare that enough is enough is enough is enough. We are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We are not attacked. We are not the victim. We are not barely making it. We are declaring today it's time to let my people go and the spirit of pharaoh will not have control in this body the spirit of pharaoh will not have control in your life but the spirit of god is raising us up today to say that it is time for freedom in our lives the question must be answered how free Do you really want to be? You can be a victim for so long that being victimized becomes comfortable. Because it's all that you know. The Bible says, He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But many in the body of Christ have settled for what I call partial freedom. Partial freedom. Moses walks up to Pharaoh and says, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, okay, sure. He's like, I tell you what, I'll, I'll give them a reprieve from their tasks so that they can worship the Lord your God. But they gotta do it here. You can make your sacrifices, but you're not going anywhere. You have to stay in Egypt. And Moses repeated, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. 
So Pharaoh goes back to him. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You, want to sacri- you don't want to sacrifice in a land of bondage. I get all that. So Pharaoh says, I'll tell you what. You and all the men go. But your women and your children and your flock, they got to stay here. And Moses went back to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And so Pharaoh now, in another effort to negotiate, says to Moses, he's like, okay, okay, okay. You don't want to leave your wives and your children. He's like, I, I, you know, this is my interpretation. I, I get that. You know, because at the end of the day, Pharaoh's also looking at who he thought was his brother. And he looks at him and he says, how about this? I mean, anybody, ha- anybody grew up with boys in the house? How many knows what I'm talking about? Have, have you seen these conversations where one says, I want to do this? And the other says, oh, how about this? You know, it's like it would be as if in my house, Josiah would walk back to Judah's room, which contains an Xbox, and he would be like, hey, 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 Judah, I want to play on, on the Xbox. And then Judah would say, eh, how about this? And I'm saying it as if it's actually happened before. Imagine that. Uh, how about this? And then Josiah would say, no, I, it's only fair. Let me play the Xbox. Uh, how, how, about, how about you can go out and have the TV? I, I want the... And then there's like this brothers like to negotiate, especially when one brother, and I'm not going to name any names, but when one, one brother doesn't want to relinquish what the other brother wants. <laughs> Do you know anything about that, Walter? I'm not sure if you know anything about that or not. Dusty looks guilty. I don't know what that's all about. But... But he says, he says, okay, how about this? How about, how about you, all the men, all your wives, and all your children, you can go. But leave me your flocks. Leave me your herds. And Moses said, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. You know the rest of the story. The plagues ensued. You see, the problem is, the problem is, and somebody needs to write this down, the problem is the enemy will always try to negotiate your freedom. He can't do, listen to me, he can't do anything to stop you from getting saved. Are you with me? No, he can't. He can't stop you from getting saved. God's bigger than that. But what he can do is he can make sure you're only partially free. He can, make, he can see to it that your spirit man is free, but your soul and your flesh are bound. And he'll negotiate your freedom. He, he'll say, fine, you know, when you die, you'll go to heaven one day. But in the meantime, I'm going to make sure you struggle financially. I'm going to make sure you struggle with addiction. I'm going to make sure you struggle with this area of your life and that area of your life. And so I'll let a little bit of you go. You know, you know okay, fine, I'll let, I'll let you go, but your kids aren't going to get saved and your wife's not going to get saved, you know, j- just you. But, but we have to have the determination Moses had where he says, but the Lord said, let my people go. That means me. That means my brother. That means my siblings. That means my sister. That means my wives. That means my kids. That means everything that we own when we talk about freedom we're talking about whole freedom see partial freedom partial freedom will only allow god access into one area of your life or into two areas of your life but total freedom gives god access to everything in your life i don't know about you i'm not interested in being kind of free i'm not interested when i was a kid i used to hear this preaching all the time When you get to heaven, you're really going to be free. And people would shout and scream in the assemblies of God. Hallelujah. Looking like one more time. They get all excited. And I remember, I don't know where this came from other than God. I remember being 12 years old. And I heard somebody testify. You know, have you ever been in a testimony service that was more defeat than victory? Yeah, I'm, that's why I think it's a good thing not to have testimony service all the time because I've seen testimony services give more glory to Satan than Jesus. Yeah. This lady got up and she was like, 
Pastor, you pray for me because the devil's been after me all week, bless his holy name. And she's like, and I just want to testify. I'm still saved. (laughs) On my way to heaven. And glory to God, Pastor, when we get to heaven, we're really going to have freedom and victory. And the whole church went, Woo! Hallelujah! And I went, (laughs) My mother noticed I did not stand up and shout and get excited when she said this, like the rest of the church. We get back to the parsonage. Walk across the parking lot. Church here, parking lot here, house here. Walk across the parking lot and get to the house. We sit down to lunch. My parents were like, notice you didn't get too excited with the testimony this morning. I said, absolutely not. And they said, what was the problem? I said, the problem is I don't agree with what she said. They said, why not? It was good. And I said, question. And I said, please show me in the Bible where I have to wait to heaven to experience freedom and victory. My dad said, where did you get this? I said, I don't know. And I said, but we sing a few songs that disagree with her testimony. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt. No freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came. And listen to me, and glory to God, he set me free. I said, it, I said that song does not say that I'll be free when I get into heaven. I am going to go to heaven already free. Are you with me? So, total freedom is what I'm after. I'm not after kind, kind of free. I'm not after my spirit is free, but my soul is a hot mess. Do I have anybody with me? I mean, are you tired of settling for kind of free? Are are you tired of, it's like one Sunday, you have freedom, and the next Sunday, it's like, oh, pastor better be on his game today because I need something. Huh? All my life, I've seen that. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you don't praise God at home, it's going to be real hard to praise God in here. If you don't have victory at home, it's going to have a real difficult time to have victory when you walk into here. Amen? So listen to this. What is total freedom? What is complete freedom? Complete freedom says this. It's all or it's nothing. Listen to what Moses said in Exodus chapter 10. Pharaoh says, your livestock has to stay behind. This is Moses' reply. Our livestock will go with us also. Not a hoof shall be left behind. Glory to God. Can I tell you something? And I don't, I'm not, I don't think at all that you are my livestock. That's not what I'm saying. But if, as Moses was determined that not a hoof shall be left behind, I'm tell, I, I, I don't know if you can see it or not. I've got something different on my shoulders today. I've had enough. And I'm declaring to the enemy, there's not a, a woman There's not a man, there's not a child that will be left behind. We are all going into complete victory together. We are all headed into complete freedom together. Not one hoof shall be left behind. Glory to God. I am not interested in negotiating with the devil over your freedom. You know what I'm interested in doing? taking my size 12 and kicking him where the sun don't shine and casting him out of your life. I'm tired of it. Let me tell you something. And I know this is not good preaching. I'm sorry. And I know this is probably not what you came to hear. But it is not complete freedom. If I walk into church and sister so-and-so walks into church and we're, and then you stay there. And then I'm sitting there, and I, and I said, oh, there's sister so-and-so. I better go way to the other side of the building. I don't want none of that today. That's not complete freedom. That's not complete freedom. I'm going to show you what complete freedom looks like, okay? Because I love you. I want to be honest with you. And when we had that conversation, I felt hurt. I was offended. And I have felt like you have attacked me. But today... If you receive it or not, 
I want to say I forgive you and I love you. We may never be best of friends, but I'm not going to see my sister or my brother as an enemy either. I've been there. You may be seated. I've been there. I've been there when I felt like I was attacked after attack after attack after attack. And then you would be in a store and that same church person was there. And then it's like you turn the corner and you see him and you're like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> That's not God's will. That is not God's will for you to feel like you have to avoid somebody that you go to church with. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There isn't anybody, I repeat, there's nobody in this building that is free from all issues. We all got stuff we're fighting through. We all have stuff we're struggling through. And so this will not be, this will not be a church of this. This will be a church of this. We will be a church that makes this declaration. I don't understand your struggle, but I'm going to walk with you in your struggle. Some of us in this building need to rewatch Frozen. <laughs> because what we need is a let it go, let it go anointing. We don't need to rehearse the pain. We need to let go of the pain. When you hold somebody else captive because of how they hurt you, you're the one in prison. Unforgiveness. I don't even know why I'm saying all this, Greg. But unforgiveness, unforgiveness is like you swallowing poison and hoping your enemy dies. And for the Christian who cannot forgive, for the Christian who cannot forgive and let stuff go, for that Christian, for that Christian, they are putting their own salvation at risk. Jesus said, if you forgive men of their trespasses against you, my heavenly Father will forgive you of yours. But if you refuse to forgive men of their trespasses against you, neither will my heavenly Father forgive you. And the reason we do that is because of spiritual pride. Because who do we think we are that we can withhold forgiveness when God never did? Amen. There's a lyric. I almost brought a rap song to you today. There's a lyric. I'm trying, I think it's Andy Minio. And he said these words. For if I refuse to forgive, I show that he's not risen. When Jesus rose, he empowered us to forgive people. You know what I mean? I'm not, don't confuse forgiveness with trust. There's people in my life I have forgiven. I told Dusty this not that long ago. And I said, there's people that have done me wrong like more ways than you can even imagine. And if they walked in to this church this morning, I'd be able to shake their hand, hug their neck, and wish them God bless you. And there'd be, no, there'd be nothing in my heart fighting it because I've truly forgiven them. But if they asked me to trust them, I can't get any help in this church right here. But if, I, but if they said, hey, will, will you trust me and do this with me? I'd be like, God bless your heart. No, I won't. No, I won't. Because my forgiveness is a gift. But my trust, that's a wage. You have to earn my trust. If I give you my trust and you break my trust and you do me wrong, and I ain't trying to sound like a, like a honky-tonk song or nothing, but if we, you do me wrong, I'll forgive you and I'll love you through it. I'm probably not going to be in relationship with you, though, because I don't trust you. Amen? We're too busy passing judgment on people who hurt us that we cannot step into the ministry of reconciliation because we'd rather see them punished than to see them restored. Are you with me? Somebody said, Pastor Tim, this is supposed to be an exciting message. I told you it's not a sermon. I have to release what God gave me. 
I don't want to settle. But we will not be a kind of free church. We are going to be a totally, completely free church in Jesus' name. Let me give you one more scripture. Exodus 12, 31. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron at night. (laughs) Uh, I don't know why I find that so funny. Because when the enemy relinquishes his stronghold off your life, he's never going to do it in the middle of the day where people can see it. He called for Moses and Aaron by night. And this is what he said. You and all your people and all your livestock. He said, get up and get out of the land. Watch this. And go serve the Lord As you have said. Freedom is never granted voluntarily by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Through all of the enemy's negotiations, Moses did not change the word of the Lord. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. And finally, Pharaoh said, you may go. You and all that you have, you may go serve the Lord as you have said. Today, and I don't know who the Lord's talking to, but today there are people in this building with me that you have got a decision to make. Come here, Jillian. You've got a decision to make. Let's see. Let's say Jillian represents trouble okay now if i'm focused on the attack then the trouble doesn't stay where the hurt took place the trouble now travels with me and can i tell you something if trouble uproots you out your church trouble is going to get you in your new church Oh, can I tell you something? If trouble shifts you out of a bad marriage, trouble will go with you into the next marriage. Come on, I can't get no help in here today. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So you have got to learn how to not ignore the trouble. You've got to learn how to not lie to yourself. I ain't got no trouble. I ain't got no trouble. I ain't got no trouble. I'm fine. I'm moving on, Pastor. You sound like it. I don't I don't want to confront it. I want to I want to just move on with the rest of my life. But the problem is you still drag in trouble with you. And the same person might not hurt you, but it's still happening in the same church. You understand what I'm saying? You have to confront the trouble. And what you have to say is, your time in my life is broken in Jesus' name. So I am choosing today to let you go, let you go, and get rid of it. Get rid of it. I'm going to tell you something. You will never overcome what you refuse to confront. You'll never overcome what you refuse to con- confront. you got, you got to learn how to say this. You, you, there is victory in these words. I'm just going to be honest. You hurt me. I've been struggling with what you said or what you did. But I'm tired of feeling attacked. So I'm going to say, I love you with the love of the Lord. And if I've done something to make this worse, forgive me. And whether or not they ever apologize will not affect my freedom. I'm going to be free. Totally and completely free. And I want to tell you something what the devil will do. The enemy will send other people who are not connected to the situation to keep asking you how you're doing. (laughs) I knew this pastor, real quick, I'm almost done. 
I knew this pastor that got really hurt in the church he was pastoring. The very people he gave his life for ended up wanting to kill him. And God moved him. He left. And he tried to move on with the rest of his ministry and the rest of his life. But his other pastor friends and his family members kept asking him, well, what do you hear out of that church anyway? Don't do that. Don't do that. And it affected this pastor until this pastor finally said one day, I, when I left, I removed my rearview mirror and I'm not looking back. And I don't care to rehearse the pain. I don't care. They are in God's hands. I'm in God's hands. And what happens with them has nothing to do with me. Can I tell you something? Some of us need to go through that same process. And I'm, I'm not going to point anybody out. I'm not going to call out. But God's been speaking to me the whole time I've been preaching. There are people in this church. There are people here this morning, right here, right now, that have other people in this church that you need to make things right with. The Bible says, the Bible says this, if you have ought against your brother, you are to go to them and make it right. You're to go to them and make it right. It is spiritually pride to say, well, when they make it right, it will be right. How about you make it right? And if they don't make it right, that's now on them and you're free in Jesus name. For those visiting, we're not a troubled church. Don't misunderstand me. Because we got some folks here today that haven't been here or haven't been here in a long time. And there's some stuff in your life God's been dealing with all morning. It's time to deal with the junk. See, I would like to build a church based on just the good stuff. I would love to do that. I would love to get in here like your cheerleader and say, rah, 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 sis, kumba, God is good. There's no problems with anybody. But then I would have to repent for being a liar. And God has sent me in here this morning like he sent Moses to inform the enemy, God's people are going free. We're going free in Jesus' name. Just because I can't see it, just because my wife can't see it, just because the leadership of this church can't see it, doesn't mean that God doesn't see it, guys. God wants to deliver people this morning. And I feel, I feel a supernatural anointing coming in this room right now. Would you lift your hands? Lift your hands all over this room. God is dealing. I feel the anointing for deliverance coming in the room right now. Something has to break. Cue that up, please. Something has to break. Something has to break 